why don't you watch me read one and then what we'll do is we'll let you guys read one, a different one. That's probably the best way to do it. So you right click on her, go to open four dimensional viewer in Centera Heart, it loads. This one's loaded and you click this preset. Now, when you click this preset, it's giving you a LAO cranial view of the heart in a MIP, a maximum intensity projection. So recognize your anatomy here. This is anterior, this is posterior, this is left and right. This is an LAO cranial view. This is the ascending aorta, descending aorta. Your goal in step one and two of the algorithm is to be sure there's no coronary disease before you get to the great vessels. So the first thing you do is right click on the aorta and pan it to the center. So that is a right click. And the way, uh, again, you're gonna wanna put the, you're gonna wanna, let me open up that PDF of the uh, reading sheet here. These are the, th this is what I want you to put in front of you for the first day or two. You probably aren't gonna need it after Wednesday, but for the first day or two, put this in front of you so you have it as a, as a uh, reference. Once the ascending aorta is in your crosshair, your next move is to simply right click and middle click and that brings up this razor blade okay that's the cut plane if you push the mouse forward you will find the left main it will be coming off the order right there and that's the left main okay now you right click on that left main and you pan it to the center so whatever vessel you're interrogating you want to pan it to the center so this left main is, we can see it coming down the interventricular groove. It's giving off a ramus. Here's the appendage superimposed on it, just superior to it. If you cut below that appendage, you'll see that there's a circumflex as well. This is the great cardiac vein. This is the triangle of Braca Mouche right here. Now my first thought is I want this LED lined up north and south along the crosshairs because the LED marks the interventricular groove. So I'm gonna left click along the bottom of the screen, rotate straight across until it is north and south along the crosshair. Basically what I have just done is give myself a four chamber view. So if I cut in to the screen, I'll be looking at more or less a four chamber view, okay? It's a little bit foreshortened, that's okay. Cut back to the surface, LED, because the LED follows the septum. Not perfectly, but pretty close. Okay, so now at this point, we can start to vessel walk. So what that means is the combination of mouse moves that allows us to clear the left main and LED of any disease. So for the left main, I don't feel like I can see that very well yet, so I left click, and I rotate along the blue lines this way. And then I left click and I rotate straight up along the blue lines. And now I have a better look at that left main. I feel like I can see it better. If I left click and rotate across, I can see it even better, move it across. And I should feel pretty good that that left main is okay. Now if I switched, this is a MIP though, so if I'm worried at all about any of these little pixels here, I can switch to an NPR and look at the source data, which is the thinnest possible slice at 0.6 millimeter slice, uh, and then click MIP again and come back to the MIP. So this is about as normal a left main as you're ever gonna see. If this looks abnormal to you, then you're probably a good cardiologist because I remember 15 years ago looking at this saying, you gotta be kidding me. This looks like the most diabetic, diffusely diseased LED I've ever seen, and that's because it's slightly pixelated, um, but this is as good as it's gonna get in 2020. This is 
this is an outstanding quality cardiac CT. This level of noise and pixelation is going to be seen in every CT scan because the slice thickness of a CT is 0.6 or 0.5 millimeters. The slice thickness of the cath is much, much better than that. Spatial resolution is well better than this. So if you're, you cannot compare the spatial resolution of a CT scanner with the spatial resolution of an image intensifier in the cath lab. Uh, we don't use this to decide to, to, to compete with the cath lab. We use this to decide who goes to the cath lab. And cardiac CT competes with nuclear, not with, not with, uh, it competes with nuclear and stress echo and all the other non-invasive techniques, not with cath. So this is a normal left main. Now I'm going to left click and rotate back and then left click and rotate back again. And now I'm staring at the left uh, LAD. I'm going to line that up by left clicking along the bottom of the screen and now line that up and pan, right click. So I'm just using those same tools that are in that blue box at the top of the algorithm. So I left click and rotate left and right, left 90 degrees and back to the center. And in that way now I have cleared the first centimeter of the LAD of any disease. So now I'm going to right click here and pan up Okay, now to see some, some of the distal LED that's out of plane, you simply left click and rotate in the opposite direction. So left click, rotate in the opposite direction. And it brings the rest of the heart into view by rotating that into your plane of view. So this is the LED. This is a bifurcating diagonal branch. What I do is follow the LED and I don't worry about the diags until I walk back up to the triangle home position. So now I'm going to left click along the bottom of the screen, rotate across here. Here's the LED going down the interventricular groove. This is the right ventricular outflow tract leading to the sinuses of the pulmonic valve, the main pulmonary artery, right and left pulmonary artery. Pan, I right click here and pan over here. And now I left click and rotate left, looking for any plaque and then back. Right and back. Always come back to the center where you were or you're gonna get lost. What we are doing is following the interventricular groove with the vessel in the middle of it, looking left and right for any signs of disease. And why do I move left and right? The concept is the same, that we do in the cath lab. When we have a, when we're in the cath lab, what do you do with your image intensifier? When you have a patient on the table, you move the, the camera 90 degrees to one corner to REO and then back. And then you move the camera 90 degrees to the other corner and back. Why do we do that in the cath lab? So that we don't miss eccentric stenoses. And that's the same concept here because there could be a stenosis, well, while this looks like a normal segment, there could be a stenosis that's out of plane. And the only way you're gonna find it is by taking this and moving it like an eye, eye 90 degrees back and forth. Okay, now down here, this is looking kind of piddly. Why does this look piddly? Well, you gotta remember that there is no engaged catheter here, okay? You guys know what kind of streaming you get in the cath lab on a weekday when, you're, when you don't push on the manifold, you know, when your bicep is feeling kind of piddly. Well, the same thing happens. Think about the amount of streaming you get in the cath lab if you don't push on that manifold. Think about the kind of streaming we're getting here when there's no engaged catheter at all in the patient. All we're doing is injecting a bolus of contrast in the vein, letting it circulate through the right heart, left heart, and hoping it percolates down the coronaries. The only way you can get any contrast down these coronaries is if you give the patient two sprays of nitroglycerin before the exam to drop the LVEDP and increase the gradient for driving perf contrast down the coronaries. Now I'm, I am walking back up the LAD and here I'll look at the diags if they're large enough. It's been 15 years since I've seen interventionalists pop a bunch of stents in the diags. Uh, 15 years ago I saw that we couldn't, you couldn't leave the cath lab in my home institution with any lesion in a diag without putting a 2.2 millimeter pixel stent in it. Uh, I haven't seen that in a long time and I hope we never go back to that because 
it was a lot of unnecessary stenting. But for the diags, if they're large enough to care about, and this one is at least the size of the LED. This is a, you can measure, this is probably a 3.5. No, it's, a, it's not even a 3.0 diameter vessel. So, but if you care about it, then line it up and look at it left and right for any evidence of disease. And I don't see any, okay? So we're gonna walk back up to the LED to whenever you see the appendage, you know you're getting close because the appendage hangs like a, a floppy dog ear over the triangle of Braca Mouche. And now we're back up to the left main bifurcation. Okay, there's a ramus, intermedius, and here's a cirque. So this is the interventricular groove, and this is the, is the AV groove. If you cut in, you will see that in the ventricle. The AV groove is where the mitral valve lives. The interventricular groove is where the interseptum lives. Aortic valve is more or less the center of the crosshair. So now we're going to walk down the ramus and cirque. So because the ramus is laid out pretty well like this, I'm not going to take too much pain to line it up, but it's a reasonable caliber. It's probably a 2-0 vessel, so I'll just look across. Not that I think we're going to revascularize that ramus, but hopefully in 2020, since the ischemia trial, we're not putting stents down these little ramuses. So your goal is to read this looking for any lesions that deserve medical therapy and any lesions that deserve revascularization. And if you're a ischemia trial believer, then you're really just looking for left main and prox LED. And if they don't have that, you're going to treat them medically until they have angina. Now, here is, um, here is the circ. What I did without thinking, I should actually go back and just do it by articulating what I'm doing is I recognize that the interventricular groove is north and south along the crosshair and the AV groove is horizontal to that. So all I did was I, I, I reasoned, I want the AV groove now lined up north and south. So I left click along the bottom of the screen and I make the circumflex now north and south along the crosshair. That's the way my brain works. There's no theoretical reason why, it's just the method I've developed to keep the, the grooves lined up north and south. So now the LED is going across the blue line here and the circ is here. So we, we move left and right. Okay, looking for any lesion. And this is a small piddly non-dominant circ. So we're not gonna care too much about it. Right here, you'll say Basine. Are we gonna call that normal? Yeah, we're gonna call that normal because that's as normal as it gets by cardiac CT on a 64 slice scan. There's no engaged catheter. There's a slice line artifact cutting across here. If you wanna change phases of the cardiac cycle at any time, you can change phases of the cardiac cycle. As a cine, you can also play it in cine mode. Um, if you want to look at an old school kind of angiogram, but that's normal. And that's, that will come with ex experience, meaning in a few days after you look at a couple of caths and there's, there's a bunch of caths in your, in your correlation files. I want you to look at that circ that gets cath, non-culprit vessels. When you look at the cath, you'll see that's normal all day long. But if you tell me today, Doc, Basine, I am not comfortable calling that normal, then great. That means you're a good cardiologist. How long have you been at this? Four hours? There's no way you're going to be comfortable until you see a bunch of cath films in this course. Okay? So that's a normal circ. So at this point, we are done with the LED and circ, and now we're going to do the RCA. The RCA, I click A on the keyboard. Okay? I pan till I find the aortic valve. This is the left atrium. Cut in till you find the aortic valve, and there it is. And then I cut plane. That means right click razor blade and bring a cut plane until you see the RCA coming off. That's the RCA in the right AV groove. What I like to do, I, I don't do it now, but I remember doing it years ago is is hit control and make the MIP slab 30 millimeters just for a second. So that means I, I'm gonna hit control with my left hand, hit the mouse and make the MIP slab 40 just for a second. And how did I do that? I did that by 
on that PDF at the top under the vessel walk algorithm in blue, it's listed as to thicken the MIP slab, hit control, middle click. It's the, it's the, it's the last second to last mouse move. Okay. Now what that does is it shows me the RCA transiently in its largest form. Great, you would say, are we done? No, you cannot read the RCA at 40 millimeters. You have to read it at five. But this just shows me the trajectory that we're going to follow. Now, what you can do is we want to, we want to vessel walk down the RCA by, from an ARIO projection. So if you left click here and rotate straight across the screen, you will convert this LAO to ARIO. So left click. And you can see my camera angles down here on the bottom left. See where it says LEO 50? If I left click here and rotate straight across the screen, I'm slowly gonna make that LAO projection an ARIO projection. Now it's ARIO 30. And you guys remember from your cath lab eras, you tend to start with an ARIO 30. Now, if I make my MIP slab five by clicking up here, I'm in a straight REO view. That's proximal RCA, that's distal RCA. Here's a tricuspid valve leaflet, right atrium, right ventricle, right ventricular outflow tract. What we're gonna do is left click and rotate straight down the blue line to look at the RCA from a osteal view. Why do we do this? Because we don't wanna miss osteal disease, guys. Just like you don't wanna miss osteal left main, you don't want to miss osteal RCA disease. So that is the RCA, okay, in a REO view. Now, this is a very REO steep view, REO cranial. If you try to get this angle in the cath lab, you're going to be pushing that image intensifier against somebody's face, right? So this is not a view that we generally get in the cath lab. But now what we do is vessel walk down the RCA. And by vessel walk, I mean the combination of mouse moves that is left click, rotate left and back, rotate right and back, looking for any plaque. I don't see any. If I did, then I would click on NPR and move the wheel a few clicks at a time looking to see if it's real on the granular images. Then switch back to MIP and keep going. So now I've cleared the proximal RCA. I want to follow the distal and mid. So I'm going to left click and rotate in the opposite direction, rotating the rest of the heart into view. So here is the mid RCA. This is the right atrial appendage. This is the right ventricle. If you are vessel walking correctly along the natural grooves of the heart, there will always be Cham different chambers on either side of the blue lines, in this case, right atrium and right ventricle, okay? Now we're going to clear the mid RCA, so of any lesion, so we left click and we move forward and back, move forward and back. Now I'll right click on the distal portion that I can see and pan it to the center and then left click and rotate straight up to bring more of the distal into view. Here is where people start to get a little bit lost, mostly because they're not used to this view in the cath lab. But you keep that groove lined up north and south. You left click and rotate straight up. And you're getting close to the bottom of the heart. This is a view where you are in the, in the gut looking up through the diaphragm at the bottom of the heart. And here is where, if you cut in and out, you will now see the, the bottom of the heart. When you see the septum, you are looking at the bottom of the heart. And if I make my MIP slab just a little bit bigger, that is the distal RCA. That's the posterior left ventricular branch. You might say, hey, shouldn't there be a PDA coming to the inferior part of the septum? And there would be, except this RV marginal continuation is supplying the uh, PDA distribution in this patient. So because there's a RV marginal supplying the PDA distribution here, you don't have a big chunky traditional 
PDA. You have a little wispy PDA coming straight across here. That's okay. This is about as normal as it gets for the RCA LED and circ. So if you don't say this is normal, I think it's because you're a good cardiologist and you've only been at this for a few hours. Mostly when people on the first day of this course, people look at this and they say, I'm not comfortable calling this normal. It looks diffusely diseased. There's all these little pixels and slice artifacts. And, and that's good. That means you're just being super careful. In a few days, you're going to see that this noise that you see along the edge of the coronary has to be interpreted in terms of the noise in the entire data set. It's not like looking at the cath. You know, you, your eyes are used to cath angiography, not the lower spatial resolution of CT angiography right now. So at this point on the algorithm, I check off coronary is normal and we are done with step one and two. Before I move to step three, any questions? Anybody? Can you repeat the RCA again? It's important. Sorry, do the RCA again? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I joined a little late because uh, I had some technical issues. So the directions, is it just changing automatically because you're moving the cursor or are you changing the positions? The head, foot, the right, left, and the AP. It's, those are changing automatically as you move the mouse. Okay. Uh, yeah. So like you can, you can move the mouse to um, any, any, move, any direction you want and the, those will change. Uh, the best orientation is this little box down here. Right. So when I move this, that, that is much more sensitive than these letters. Okay. I know what you're saying. You're saying, hey man, if I just move to REO, this is still head foot and this is AP, uh, but the box it will give you much more refined view of where you are in space and the camera angle that will also help you. But the camera angle is not 100% accurate because the patients never at ISO center when they had their CT scan, right? Mm -hmm. CT techs don't take a lot of pain to be sure the patient's at ISO center. That's why the camera angles can be off. But the, uh, but the blue this box is the best orientation, okay? Okay, thank you. So let's do the RCA again. So what we do is we hit A on the keyboard, cut in and out, put the aortic valve in your crosshair, and then um, I like to make the RCA MIP slab transiently very large. So I hit Control, hold the mouse down, it brings up this arrow, and then I'll make it 45 millimeters, just for a second. And then look and see, well, what is the real shape of this RCA? And I can see that this RCA is a standard RCA C with a big PLV branch here. But you don't see a PDA coming off because this RV marginal branch is coursing to supply that septum. See that? Okay, so now you have a large mental picture of the RCA. Now you have to read it segment by segment. So you can left click on it, rotate it to RAO, look at it from a top down and then, but you have to switch it from 45 to five to read it segment at a time. Why do we have to read it at five millimeters? Why can't I just read it at 45? The reason is, the vessel is five millimeters across. If you read it at 45, then there could be, on a MIP, there could be some pixels over here that are brighter than a pixel here and you will bury pathology. Because the very nature of the maximum intensity projection is it takes multiple slabs, it takes multiple pixels, okay, goes through the matrix, and it pulls only the brightest voxels to your eye. So if there are some cubes that are way out of plane, but in the slab that are brighter than the one that's in your coronary, it could bury plaque. So by its very nature, the MIP only shows you the brightest. So it can bury 
soft plaque because soft plaque is not bright, it's dark. That's why you, ha you can use MIPS to make you faster in your reading, provided that you do two things. One is s always set your MIPS lab to about the size of the vessel you're interrogating, which is five millimeters for a coronary. And number two, if you see any irregularity on a MIP, you have to switch to NPR to make your diagnosis, to double check your diagnosis on the thinnest possible slice, which is the NPR, unlike the MIP, okay? So now on the MIP, we, on this, we move left and right, all the way to the edge and back, and then all oh, the way- Mo, to... excuse me, is the NPR the same as the G button? Or is that yes. different? Yes, it's the same. So if you hit G, you can do this this way, okay? but it's gonna take you longer. In general, this is the same thing. It's, that is the NPR. So if you see a funny a single lesion, you could do that, but then you're gonna be hitting G back and forth all the time. I only hit the G or the NPR if I see something. If it looks this normal, I just keep going. Just keep reading on the MIP until you see something funny, okay? Back and forth. This looks normal, so I'm not gonna hit the G. I'm not gonna hit the NPR as long as it looks this good. And as long as every centimeter or so you move left and right, looking for something that's out of plane and eccentric, just like you do in the cath lab with an II. And then here, you might have to cut in and out, and I might make the MIPS lab just slightly bigger just to connect the vessels here. And that's the only view that's really not a traditional cath lab view, but it is the RCA. If I follow that back up in the right AV groove and turn it this way, you'll see that's what you're doing. You're following it from here all the way down to that posterior left ventricular branch. In effect, you are using the same technique that you learned in the cath lab. This is that RCA view, right? You're following the RCA from this angle, only you're, only you're taking it, you're turning it from here, 90 degrees, to put the AV plane right here in an REO projection and following it. So this is what you're doing. You're following the vessels in their natural grooves to exclude coronary disease. Any questions so far? Everybody's really quiet, it's starting to scare me. Um, let's, uh, let's keep going, okay, no questions? You, you will, uh, you'll, you'll come up with questions, I'm confident. Now, the, this is where you are done with the coronaries you would love to drop the mic and say, okay, I'm done, I'm out of here, but this is where your hard work actually begins, okay? Because you're, um, you're hardly done, you've got to read the, the great vessels. To do that, recognize that this reconstruction is cutting off the aorta. We asked the techs to scan the patient one time, but to do one reconstruction that cones down on the heart, that was this reconstruction. We asked them to do another reconstruction here that had the large field of view, okay? So that's the one we need to open to get to step three in the algorithm. Before I get to step three and we start doing the housekeeping, let me pull that PDF back up one time. Let's, let's follow the vessel algorithm one more time. When you right click, you pick center aorta for this or heart again? Heart, heart. Uh, it, you can do the aorta, it's fine. Um, it's not that different. Um, but I think if you stick with the heart today, you'll, you'll develop the, the, the best algorithm to start, okay? So these were the mouse moves. All of this is done in about 90 seconds. Let me review.
Step one is um, you, you want a chart, okay? So when you read scans, you don't really want to just have a scan in front of you. Make your administrative staff create a patient chart, either a digital PDF chart um, if you're reading at home or at night or a physical chart. And in that chart, you've got to have some patient information, prior caths, prior echoes, prior nukes, at least the office note as to why the patient's being sent. You don't want to read these scans without some clinical positioning. Once the scan is done, you should note in, uh, in the chart, when I sit down, I want this information written out for me. And it's usually the most important thing I want from the text is what was the final heart rate? Not the heart rate when the patient showed up in the center, but the final heart rate at the moment the CT scanner turned on after they gave them beta blockers. If you tell me what that heart rate is, I can tell you how good the quality is gonna be. If that heart rate is over 70, quality is gonna fall off exponentially. If it's 60, 65, it's gonna be great. And I'll be able to read it faster without a lot of artifacts. So the lesson for cardiologists is beta block the hell out of your patients, get the heart rate down, way down, and a lot, all good things happen when you get that heart rate down. Uh, not only is your time to diagnosis faster, but the accuracy of the test is faster. And as cardiologists, we really are, shouldn't be afraid of beta blockers. We do a lot of scarier things to the heart than give people some low pressure. Um, you want to understand, is the field of view correct? So there's three fields of view for the cardiologist. The largest field of view is if the patient has a bypass. So if there's a lima graft, you're going to need to scan the whole chest from the clavicles to the diaphragm. Um, very, you know, we don't use this a lot for bypass patients. Some people do. Um, I think it's fine for the grafts. The problem is the natives kind of, the natives suck because they're calcified in CT. Um, we'll do it for grafts, but not, or a missed graft. You tried to cast somebody and and couldn't find a graft. Typically that's because there's a rema somewhere. Um, but that's, uh, that's the large field of view is clavicles to diaphragm. The second field of view is the inpatient field of view. That's for anybody in the ER or an inpatient with chest pain. You want to go ahead and do the arch down, arch to diaphragm. That way, if there's an acute aortic syndrome, you're not going to miss arch hematoma or a arch dissection. Or if there's a dissection, you're not going to, you're not going to have to rescan them again to try to figure out whether it's a type A or type B. Okay. And then everybody else, which is the majority of people, 85% of patients in a cardiac CT lab are going to get just the heart. And that's scanned from the carina to the diaphragm. Most adult hearts are 120 millimeters from top to bottom. And so that's all you need because you don't need the arch in an outpatient routinely. So those are the three fields of view. Um, remember in, in CT, you don't have control over the lateral aspects of the field of view. You only have control over the superior to inferior aspects of how much of the patient you're gonna scan from head to foot. It's not like MRI where you have total control and you can, you can scan a square or a rectangle around a patient. The next quality control issue that I check my mental box off is the window width and level. And I just have those set up in presets um, 700 and 350, I'm going to read for coronaries, 800 and 200 for the thorax. And if we scan the patient at 100 kV setting, it's the window width and level setting to 1800 and 700. Let me show you what I mean. The radiation dose delivered to the patient is actually, uh, there's two stamps in every image the FDA requires that the KV setting on the CT scanner and the MA setting be stamped into the image. KV is the voltage and the MA is the current across the CT scanner plate. The bottom line is adjusting the KV will exponentially increase or decrease the radiation dose delivered to the patient. Adjusting the MA is fine control and will only linearly drop or increase the radiation. 
So I don't really give a lot of rules to the technologists about the MA, but I definitely give them rules about the KV. And the number one rule is if the patient's BMI is less than 30, decrease the KV to 100. So there were three studies that came out called the protection studies, and they basically showed if you just drop that KV to 100, and anybody with a BMI less than 30, you will exponentially slash their radiation dose, and there's no change in image quality, okay? But you do have to change your window width and level setting when you drop the radiation dose, and that's, that, that's the special radiation dose setting, uh, KV setting, if you drop to KV. So I have three presets labeled in my workstations, and I make everybody in my labs doing it. I'm reading at six cardiac CT labs, and we, we try to get everybody to read using the same window width and level settings. Because ischemia is just a click away. If everybody reads a different window width and level settings in, in my labs, then somebody's gonna look at the same stenosis and call it 70 as, as me calling it 40. So that's why you wanna have presets set up for this and synchronize with everybody in your hospital who's reading, okay? Next thing is timing of contrast. You want more contrast in the aorta than you do in the descending aorta uh, or in the PA for sure. Coronary vein filling. If you're seeing a scan and their veins are filled equivalently, that's not good. Um, that means that your techs are bringing in too much levophase and they're, they need to reduce their delay time when they acquire the CT scan, okay? We call that venous contamination, but basically it's, it's bringing in the arteries and the veins with equivalent opacification, and that's not good. You want the arteries bright and the veins dark, okay? And then kernel and banding artifacts, we're gonna get to, no big deal there. Signal to noise, is not a huge deal. These are kind of fine points. Uh, larger patients are going to be noisier than skinny patients for sure. But sometimes I'll scan a child, for example, in the children's hospital, and it will be very noisy. But that's because the technologist dropped the KV all the way down to 80. If I'm scanning a two-year-old like I did last Wednesday, we dropped the KV to 70. And the net result was a millisievert dose of 0.3, like just in the chest X-ray range of doses. But, the, sc but the, scanner, the scan itself was very noisy, but we deliberately did that to reduce the radiation dose, especially in the young. So in my labs, I tell people, my techs have a little sign on the wall that says, don't scan anybody less than 30 unless you've called Dr. Basin first. Because what are the chances of somebody having obstructive disease less than 30? Um, if they're less than 30, do a non-radiating test. Do a stress MRI or do a, do a plain treadmill or a stress echo. There's no reason to go doing a coronary CT for a coronary disease unless you're looking for something specific like congenital disease. So this is step one. And then I dictate what was the final heart rate after 200 of low pressure was given. Total contrast dose is usually about 80 cc's, 85 cc's, overall quality. So all of this done in about, I don't know, 90 seconds to a minute kind of quickly, all right? But I put all the steps in here for you to think through, although given, you're gonna do it really fast. And if there's only one thing that's quality control, the most important thing is a final heart rate. You beta block the hell out of your patients and your quality is gonna go straight up. If you do a poor job beta blocking people, then it's, it's, it's gonna fall apart. Your time to diagnosis will be high, your accuracy will be poor, and your program's not gonna take off. Do you ever see issues with heart block or things like that with big bay blocker doses or not really? I'm gonna show you my protocol. In 15 years and 33,000 scans in my database, not a single heart block, never had to give a single dose of atropine, never had to use that temp wire that's sitting next to the scanner in, 30, in, in 15 years, in 33,000 scans, scanning all these people. As long as you just use beta blockers, because once you saturate every beta receptor with low pressor, PO and IV, you're not gonna start to cause heart block. You're gonna start to see that when you start throwing DILT on and a beta blocker and you know 
and something else. So just favor beta blockers. And so my beta blockade protocol is in your packet in the, uh, in the OneDrive on the poster. It's pretty aggressive, but we've been doing it for 15 years this way. It's actually, it's been validated in other centers and nobody's ever had to give even a single dose of atropine, just favoring beta blockers. So it goes beta blocker, beta blocker, PO, and then IV up to 40, low presser. Then only then you should decide, okay, do I, are they anxious and we should give them a little bit of Valium or some chewable Xanax, a little, a little benzo, or um, which you shouldn't give them unless they have a driver. If they drove to the center yourself, then you know you don't want to make them high and, and let them drive out the drive off the off the hospital. And then um, I, I do you have any cutoffs for low EF patients? Like how much beta blocker you give? Yeah. So with with low EFs, you know, if they're first of all, if I know their EF is 30, 35, I'll just give them IV low presser. But what I generally do in my own office is usually I titrate up their core egg for a month, maybe six weeks. And then I send them to the hospital once they're beta blocked on their core egg and their, and their ACE and stuff. So, so for heart failure, here's my new, here's the protocol I've been doing for the last five years. I was trained at Emory, which, you know, we'll cath anybody for any reason at Emory. So when I was there, we would cath pericarditis. So the way I was trained was, Somebody comes in with heart failure, you diurese them until they lay flat, and then you do a right and left heart cath before they leave the hospital. And that was just, that's just dogma, okay, it's standard. But these days what I do is I look at them and I diurese them until they lay flat, and then I start them on their heart failure meds. And if I think that this is just hypertensive cardiomyopathy uh, because they haven't taken their meds for years or or, you know, it, it doesn't, I think there are very low chance of having obstructive coronary disease, then I don't cath them. If you think about it, what good is that left, what good is that normal left heart cath getting you if you don't think it's going to be coronary disease? Probably not much if you're not going to revascularize them. And what good is their right heart cath data? I know their wedge is high. I don't have to do a right heart cath to determine that. I don't have, and if I'm not going to put them on milrinone, what good is that right heart cath going to do for me? Not much. So, what I do is then discharge them on their core egg, see them in the office in two weeks, titrate up their core egg, and then in a month, titrate it up again and do the coronary CT. And they go in as an outpatient beta blocked on core egg and they're fine. And then I can say they're normal. So I just defer the coronary look for a month until they're beta blocked on core egg, rather than taking somebody that has a low EF with new onset heart failure. Um, wait till they're compensated and then do it. And that. I know that doesn't buy me a uh, cath, uh, normal cath RVU, but uh, that's fine with me, okay? So now down the, down the list here, step two is to assess the coronaries. We just did that. That's called vessel walking down the cardiac planes, manipulate in five millimeters to see if, and if there's a potential lesion, you switch to NPR or click G for gangster. Home is your aortic valve left main. That's the triangle of Braca Mouche. And when you click the preset, the Centera Heart preset, MIP, it will go there automatically. And that's this view, the triangle view. That's your home position. Then once you get to that view, go through the coronaries and then dictate the coronaries. We'll talk this evening about heart flow. Let's skip that because a lot of us aren't doing it and it's not completely accepted and it's costly but and you only really need to send one send someone for a ffrct if you have an intermediate stenosis so let's defer that for a little while step three is where the money is step three is where the risk is so let's talk about thoracic housekeeping okay What you wanna do is go to the series that is labeled 75% for a lot of these scans. And most importantly, has a large field of view where you can see 
all the great vessels are incorporated, not the cone down field of view. I saw a, I reviewed a legal lawsuit where a, believe this, I, I, I probably even shouldn't say it, but I'm saying it. This, this guy read for six months, cardiac CT on the small field of view, not realizing that there was on every case, a large field of view at 75% that showed the entire aorta. And he read only the small field of view without the entire aorta imaged in that for six months, okay? And there were multiple patients that did not have their entire data set reviewed. You don't want that to happen to you. So remember that in many labs, a large field of view for the entire aorta is included and then a small field of view that is coned down for the heart, okay? So for the great vessels, we're gonna right click on this and uh, I'm gonna go to Sentara Heart. Um, and now I'm gonna click this little macro called housekeeping, thoracic housekeeping. And what that does is it switches me to an MPR for multiplanary format. It also changed my window width and level setting. You'll notice our window width and level setting is no longer 700 and 350. It's now 800 and 250. Let me show you the difference. 700 and 350 is a little bit darker, okay, than 800 and 250, all right? So there's a subtle difference there, but it's an important difference. So you wanna be careful about these window width and level settings and follow follow presets that you have set up um, so that you aren't inadvertently one week calling the same lesions 40% and then, then the next week 80% like you, you could potentially do. So now what's the housekeeping? You click this. We are now going to review the aorta. Now, this is where your liability is. And I said this morning, thou shall not miss an acute aortic syndrome or a pulmonary embolism. Let's talk about the aorta first. There's three planes you have to review the aorta. AP, so that's ascending aortic arch and descending. So this is just by, I'm right clicking, middle clicking and scrolling front to back, okay? Then you want to do it candy cane. Now how do you do, what does candy cane refer to as a sagittal LEO 60? So if I left click right here and rotate straight across 60 degrees, and I can tell I'm 60 degrees because down here it says LEO 57. The other way I can tell is if I left click and rotate about two thirds of the way from the center to the edge, that's about 60 degrees. If I rotate all the way to the edge, it's 90 degrees. That gives me LEO 60. And remember in the cath lab, when you come up with your JUDs, you usually go to LEO 60. And that's because that then gives you a nice candy cane view of the aorta. Okay, so let me do it again slowly. To get the candy cane view of the aorta, you put the aortic valve in your crosshair, you left click and you rotate straight across about 60 degrees. And then you right click, middle click, bring up the razor blade and cut in. And that is your candy cane view of the aorta. All right. And then you hit F on the keyboard and look at it the way the radiologists do, F for feet coming out of the screen. And now you scroll black to black. So you put this here and you follow this until the screen goes black because that is the top of the data set black, then you follow it down inferiorly and you follow it all the way down to the bottom, black. Okay, now you're done with the aorta. 
Now, what are you looking for? Okay, let me show you what you're looking for. Well, you're looking for signs of an acute aortic syndrome. So before I tell you, actually, why, why doesn't somebody just tell us what constitutes an acute aortic syndrome? The disruption in the intima. Okay. With maybe a uh, intramural hematoma. Okay. Aortic dissection, pericardial effusion, and uh, aortic regurg. And penetrating aortic ulcer. Okay, guys, we got to get this straight right now. All right, let's uh, let's be very clear. There are four clinical acute aortic syndromes. Each one has a characteristic imaging finding that you'll see on the CT scan. And you wanna be crystal clear about these. They have to be burned in your memories, okay? Within 10 minutes of coming into an emergency department, you have got to determine if somebody has an ACS, pulmonary embolism, tamponade, rupture, spontaneous thorax. The, the acute aortic syndromes, there are four. Four clinical names, each one has a characteristic imaging finding. The names are clinical syndrome of a dissection and 60% are type A. The characteristic imaging finding is any visualization of an int intima, okay? So you don't wanna say double lumen because sometimes you don't have a double lumen. Sometimes you just have a little piece of intima floating in the blood flow and that is a dissection, okay? So any visualization of an intima is dissection. Intramural hematoma is the one that cardiologists screw up and miss and I know why it happens. It happens because the intima is fine and it's subtle, it's in the wall, um, and many times it looks just like atheroma. If this was, this is thick, this is like six millimeters thick, so you probably wouldn't say bacine, that looks like atheroma to me. It's also very smooth, but People call it atheroma when it's acute blood in the wall. And so this is the, this is the tough one. And how are you going to sort it out? Well, just like in acute coronary syndromes, sometimes the only way to sort it out is to put the patient in the hospital on telemetry and get serial troponins. Sometimes the only way to sort out whether this is an acute aortic syndrome or atheroma is to put them in the hospital and get serial gated CT scans. And I have gone to such lengths that I have gotten a gated CT at noon and got it another gated CT at 5 p.m. and still couldn't tell the difference. And then I came in at eight, nine o'clock at night and gave them a third gated CT. And that's when we saw that this was an intramural hematoma and converted into a classic intimal flap dissection. So 30% of IMHs will con convert to an intimal flap dissection. In the United States, a intramural hematoma is treated surgically, okay, type A. But in parts of the world, particularly in Asia, Asia, type A intramural hematoma is initially treated medically. It's different from our guidelines. And uh, tomorrow I'm gonna show you some. But this is the tough one. It's a tough one because you'll miss it from an imaging standpoint because it's it can be subtle and cognitively we'll call it atheroma. Imagine if this thickness is only two or three millimeters, you may not be able to tell the difference. If that's the case, then you put that patient in the hospital, err on the side of caution and get another CT scan in six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, and look for imaging evolution. What do I mean by imaging evolution? I mean, if this is only partially circumferential, if six hours, 12 hours later, it becomes completely circumferential, then it's not atheroma because atherosclerosis doesn't happen that fast. If it's only 40 millimeters in the superior to inferior axis, then if it evolves in 24 hours on the CT scan to now encompass 60 or 70 millimeters up, superiorly up the aorta or inferiorly down the aorta, 
then you know it's an acute aortic syndrome. It's not atheroma. So that is a logical way to sort out a acute aortic syndrome from atheroma. And this is the one that I sweat over. I got two helipads out here outside my office with choppers landing all the time. And every acute aortic syndrome in 100 miles comes to our quaternary center. So over 15 years, I, I, see, I see them all the time. And um, this is the one that we sweat over, OK? Would a different downspill yeah. units help you at all? Just yeah, so you? you know, it's funny you say that, because in the radiology textbooks, they put a lot of credence into that. They say, check the Hounsfield units right here. I'll tell you, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's good enough to hang a man's light on. I'll do it, I'll measure it, but I don't believe it uh, because technique of the CT scanner can change that. Um, so no, I don't, I don't believe it too much. I do it just sort of of interest, but I've, I've never put any stock into that. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Mo, is the intramural hematoma typically circumferential, like the whole way around, or can it be just one side? It depends on how fast they get to the hospital. Some people have uh, acute chest pain, and they get to the hospital within 30 minutes because it's the worst pain they've ever had, and it's not all the way around. It's like, you know, it's from 12 to 9. But then I'll scan them again 24 hours later, and typically it will become circumferential. So this week in this course, you're going to look at a bunch of these together with me, and um, we're going to differentiate those. Now, there is a differential for this wall thickening, okay? It's blood, blood, blood. Number two, atheroma. And number three, anybody? Inflammation? Yeah. Take, right. Takayasu or something? You got it. Vasculitis. And the typical vasculitides are Takayasu's, giant cell, riders, besets, psoriatic, so on Wednesday and Thursday, we're gonna, we're gonna sh or show you some of those, okay? So that's the three things that circumferential wall thickening can be. Third acute aortic syndrome is a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. And that is the, Im the imaging finding, you wanna be very careful with your language here. The imaging finding is a contrast outpouching, contrast outpouching, okay? Fourth, large, Aorta, big ass aorta, okay, is a symptomatic large acute aortic aneurysm. Now you would say, Basine, how am I gonna miss that? I, I think I can find a big aorta. It's not the imaging that, that does a guy in on this. What, what does a guy in is the doctor gets a guy who comes in one o'clock in the morning, 80 year old guy with an ascending aorta that measures 5.2 and his, He's, he's not having chest pain, but he says, I just don't feel right. And he has some vague, you know, vague symptoms. And they do a CT scan because he says, my doctor told me I had an aortic aneurysm and they scan it and measure it at 5.2. And then they look in PACS and see that he had an aortic aneurysm for the last five years at 5.2. It's the same exact size. So they say, huh, it's the same size. Uh, it's not torn. It's not, there's no intima disruption. There's no circumferential wall thickening of an IMH. So let's just put him in the hospital and quote unquote, tuck him in. So then overnight he ruptures two, three hours later and dies. And then at autopsy, you find that that ascending aorta has completely ruptured open and he exsanguinated. So the problem here is people don't believe that that 5.2 centimeter aorta can be flirting with every systole with the ultimate bursting, bursting strength of the aorta. And we know that the aorta will burst at a kilopascal wall tension of 800 kilopascals. So um, you cannot use the size as the only arbiter of when to operate. Sometimes you've got to use symptoms and you've got to use surgical decision-making, which means a surgeon saying, I don't know whether this guy's about to rupture or not, but 5.2 is good enough for me. And yes, three o'clock in the morning, I will take this guy who hasn't dissected to the operating room and fix him. And a lot of thoracic surgeons have been burned because they wait, they said, I'll fix him in the morning and he doesn't make it until the morning. 
because this thing is about to rupture. Okay, so, so that's why large symptomatic aneurysm of impending rupture is part of the acute aortic syndrome spectrum. Um, as is contrast outpouching as an imaging finding and circumferential wall thickening, as well as any visualization of the intima. So those are the language you wanna use in your reports. So when you're scrolling through the aorta, those are the imaging findings you're looking for and they're in the algorithm. I literally put the pictures here, okay, in the PDF so that you know what you're looking for and you wanna be very discreet, especially on inpatients about checking these off in your head that I don't see any visualization of the intima, any circumferential wall thickening, any PAUs. And tomorrow I'm gonna to drill specifically on these and, um, and pimp you guys on that, all right? And again, the way you do it is you put the aortic valve in your crosshair, you cut plane AP, you switch to candy cane and do it candy cane. And then you click F and do it the way the radiologists do it. That gives you three planes of the aorta and if you're doing three planes, three plane views of the aorta on a gated CT scan, then there is, that is the gold standard for the aorta. There's nothing better in 2020 than a gated aorta with three plane views. Um, some of your institutions are probably doing non-gated aortas. And you can tell something is gated or not if there's an R to R interval listed here. If there's no R to R interval listed here, it's not gated. And then what you will get in the ascending aorta is a bunch of pulsation artifact, okay? And that pulsation artifact both mimics a dissection and masks a dissection, and it will drive you nuts. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the first chapter of the book I'm writing is gonna be labeled Gate Stupid, because the few times that I have kicked myself is when I scan somebody without gating because I, all I did was introduce a bunch of pulsation artifact. In fact, the only scans that I will read that are not gated are when the patient is an extremist. And those are a few of the scans I'm gonna review on Wednesday morning. Those are the only times I will read a not gated scan, a non-gated scan is when I don't have time to gate. Like I don't have six minutes to gate, all right? So that's the aorta. It's, it's the cause I think of liability besides pulmonary emboli. Second, sec, for cardiologists. Second one, uh, second thing on the list now is to, is to review for pulmonary arteries. Actually, I've got, I've got the aortic valve written here. Here's the aortic valve. The aortic valve forms a T that's aimed right down the, the commissioners form a T that's aimed right down the uh, center line of the uh, aorta. If I left click right here and rotate right down the center line, I will be looking at a traditional short axis view of the aortic valve. Just the same view you get by echo every day where the non-coronary cusp is bisected by the intraatrial septum, the right, left, tricuspid valve, pulmonic insufficiency, LA and LA appendage. It's the same view you guys get by echo all the time. If I left click and rotate back, I'll be looking right here. Recognize that the aortic valve is aimed at the patient's right shoulder in almost everybody who's young. You guys do transesophageal echoes. When you put the probe in the patient's mouth up here, where this H is, you put the probe in and you, le you push the probe down this, uh, the uh, esophagus. And when you get to the aortic valve, can you see the aortic valve on FOSS very well at zero degrees? No, you can't. You usually have to switch to what degree? 30 or 45. Yeah, so why is that? Here's the reason. The angle of that aortic valve 
is about 30 or 45 degrees off the horizontal. So think, let's think about this. When you put the TE probe down the patient's mouth, zero degrees on the TEE probe is that blue line cutting straight across or this red line. That's zero degrees. When you take that transducer and make it 45 degrees, you are now making that transducer aim at this angle. And that's how come you see the aortic valve on faucet 45. When you make the transducer 90 degrees, you're the, this blue line that's coming vertically down the, down the page. You see that? So if you think like the TEE guru that you are, you will understand that those angles that you had to bulk memorize with TEE, you really wish you learned cardiac CT first and then learn TEE, you'll be a better, better TEE person. And 120 degrees on a TE probe is, let me see if I can hang on. 120 degrees obviously is this. Where you're looking at the aortic valve like that. Okay, so that is the aortic valve. I, I, I want, and tomorrow we'll dive into how you measure for TAVI and all that. That's, that's not critical. And it's not hard either. People make a big deal out of it, making it sound hard. It's not. Okay, so that's the aortic valve and the aorta. And that's your three plane review of the aorta, AP, axial, and candy cane. I just cannot emphasize it enough. I'm gonna pimp the, pimp the hell out of you guys tomorrow until you get it. Now, the pulmonary arteries, let's talk about that. There's actually nothing intellectually hard about the pulmonary arteries like there is for the aorta. And the pulmonary arteries, the differential is pretty narrow. The differential is clot, 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 and clot, okay, for a filling defect. And then rarely you'll see a clot that keeps getting bigger despite anticoagulation, and it will turn out to be a pulmonary artery angiosarcoma or something crazy like that. I've had one in 15 years. So it's basically PE. So how do you evaluate for PE? What you do is do is evaluated in two planes. So I cut through the right ventricle and I look first in the RV for any PE in transit. I don't see any. Then I put the pulmonary artery here and we cut through the pulmonary arteries looking for any filling defects. And then I'll, well, as the PA bifurcates, I'll pick one side. And I usually pick the right first. And I look through these filling, these little arteries here looking for any filling defects. Okay, I don't see any. And then I'll look through these. Look for any filling defects and I don't see any. On the other side, then I do the same. Okay, I kind of think about it in four quadrants. Then I hit F on the keyboard and do it again the way the radiologists do. Cut into the heart, there's the right ventricle, put it in your crosshair and then follow it up to the main pulmonary artery, right and left pulmonary artery, and then cut in left and right, looking for any filling defects. And you wanna be meticulous to go down to all these little branches. That is something that cardiologists tend to forget. Okay, now you're done with pulmonary arteries. Check that off on the thoracic housekeeping. And turn the page. Next thing on your algorithm are the systemic thoracic veins. There are three veins that are visible in the thorax in almost everybody on a CT scan, IVC, SVC, and the azagous vein. So let's point those out. SVC is usually pretty straightforward because contrast is being injected. That's SVC. This is the left subclavian vein, meaning the SVC here, and together they form the SVC that comes into the right atrium. The IVC, we are not injecting contrast in a groin sheath in the right femoral, so there's usually not contrast coming in there, so this is about all the contrast that ever makes it down there into the 
IVC. Uh, this is normal. You shouldn't see a bunch of contrast in the hepatic veins or IVC. If you do, then it can mean that there's elevated right heart pressure because if you power inject contrast bolus and it hits high right atrial pressure, some of it will reflux into the IVC and hepatic veins. The azygous vein, where, where is it? It is just above the right upper lobe bronchus, right here it is, entering the, here's the right upper lobe bronchus, here's the azygous, and it enters the posterior aspect of the SVC right here. And if you scroll, here it is, above the right upper lobe bronchus. You scroll posteriorly, you'll see it here, coming up along the spine, draining along the posterior aspect of the thorax. Those are the three veins that we see. One posterior, that's the azygous, and that's constant, and then SVC and IVC. Here's a, here's a schemata that you may have forgotten from a long time ago of the veins of the thorax. SVC and IVC are constant, as is the azygous vein. It's a constant. It, drain, it receives these little tributaries from the, from the paravertebral collaterals, and then it enters this at posterior aspect of the SVC. These are inconstant the accessory hemiazygous and hemiazygous, we don't see those much unless there's a lot of uh, collateralization. Uh, and on Wednesday, I'll show you some patients that have venous problems and those are filling up with contrast. The, the key thing I wanna tell you here is that, that the azygous vein normally brings non-contrasted blood along the posterior thorax and it's normally dark, like I showed you, just like the IVC and, and the um, hepatic veins are dark. If you ever see them bright, you should worry that for some reason, there's some seriously high right atrial pressure and a contrast bolus injected from one of the arms, if that bolus of contrast comes down and hits high right atrial pressure, some of that contrast will reflux into the azygous and some of it will reflux into the hepatic veins and IVC. And those are signs, CT signs, of elevated right atrial pressure. Let me show you a case that illustrates that. Um, okay, I got one here. I was teaching this course two years ago and I wasn't answering my texts and then they called me. Is this the right case? Yep. They called me repeatedly while I was teaching and I ignored the texts the reason the tech was calling is for this reason. She saw that on her initial scout film CT that the IVC and the hepatic veins were filled with contrast, bright like that. And if you look here, you'll see, see these, this is the liver, hepatic veins, IVC, all bright with contrast. That's not good. That means there's high contrast, uh, high right atrial pressure. And then this is the azygous vein she saw. See this, uh, I should turn off these annotations here. See this um, azygous vein, it's not dark. It's filled with bright contrast like that. There's, that means there was high pressure that also forced the contrast bolus that we were injecting in the arm, it forced it into the azygous as well. So what could, what could be the cause of that? She was right to call me because this was a, a type A dissection. 
See the intima here is all torn up in the ascending. And the patient is in tamponade. This is a LV, RV, little pericardial fat, all tamponade from pericardial blood all the way around. And because the patient's in tamponade from dissection, the azagus the azagus fills with contrast retrograde like this. And the contrast bolus also refluxed backwards into the hepatic veins and IVC. This was so bad, tamponade was so severe, her blood pressure was 35, 40 by the time I got to the CT scanner. The contrast you'll see doesn't even make it down the descending aorta. Um, and by the time I got to the scanner from the children's hospital, she was complaining of blindness because she, could, she couldn't see. And I think it's because her cardiac output was just falling off and she wasn't getting enough blood to the brain. And, and then she VF'd and died. So I didn't have time to do a pericardiocentesis or, or anything, it was just too late. So this is, this is illustrative of the hepatic vein pacification and SVC um, reflux contrast into the azagus here from tamponade from a type A dissection. Okay, that's the systemic thoracic veins. Moving on, pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins are, we are gonna have a whole lecture on them on Thursday when we discuss EP imaging. The easiest way to see them is to, is to switch to 3D and rotate the, the patient all the way around, line up the spine, with the blue lines, left click, give yourself a slightly cranial view and then cut in. And what you'll see is the left atrium and all the pulmonary veins coming in on both sides. So one, two, three, four. There's no reason to screw around with a TE probe trying to find all pulmonary veins in the TE lab when you can look at any old CT scan and clarify that there is no partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. Um, and some of the mistakes I see made from years ago is that people rely on TEE when you can't see the pulmonary veins. It's been definitively shown in a study from MCV that 70% that of the time you're gonna miss PAPVR if you rely only on TEE or venography. The only thing that's as accurate as CT is ice, and we're not gonna go doing ice just for, just for veins, okay? So that's how the pulmonary veins are evaluated. Um, we're gonna have a whole special lecture on those pulmonary veins later on, on Thursday, okay? As we read for EP. So that's the pulmonary veins. Next one is pericardial thickening. If we click on the, the NPR, if I hit F, I, what I did is I click the housekeeping template. Now I'm gonna hit F. If you look anterior to the right ventricle, you will see these little white, this little white pixels here. That's the pericardium. That's normal, thin pericardium. And there, it doesn't get any more normal than that thin little white line right there. Okay, that's normal. Tomorrow, I'll show you what constriction looks like because I work in Norfolk, Virginia, where there's a ton of asbestosis from the shipyards uh, for the last 30 years. And so I've had a crash course in, in constriction for, for my career here. Uh, the next one is resting perfusion. On our IHS website, Chris shows a case of COVID myocarditis with delayed enhancement. And uh, Later on today, I'm going to show you some cases of perfusion abnormalities that help you determine a chronic total occlusion. But it looks like a black hole in the myocardium right here. Um, we're going to do that later on today. Um, that's it. Now we're done with this lady. Um, I'll, 
usually now let step four, if you look on the algorithm, is review the extracardiac thoracic findings. Step five is to generate and communicate um, the report. If you look at the bottom, we dictate the coronaries. Uh, I'll say normal epicardial coronary arteries. Um, the ejection fraction, I'm gonna show you guys how to calculate tomorrow. It's not a big deal, so I don't wanna focus on that today. Um, same thing with calcium scoring. Those are so easy, you're gonna cry. So I want you to cry tomorrow, not today. Um, and then this is, where the, this is where the most important stuff is. So we're gonna focus on this part of it. Any questions about the algorithm? Okay, right now you guys should be hankering to try. Before you do, let me give you a quick anatomy review of the 3D anatomy, and then I'm gonna let you guys read the first, your first case, and I'm gonna start pimping. So let's review some three-dimensional anatomy. When I cut in through the thorax here, through the sternum, well, let me put it on a MIP for a second. Let me show you what I see when I look, okay? When I put the sternum in the cross here on the MIP, I know I'm gonna find the IMA along the left side of the sternum here, and the right internal mammary artery along the right side of the sternum, okay? And so to look and see whether the IMA or REMA were taken down for bypass, this is the first place to look. Now we cut in, what's the first ventricle you're gonna see right in front? Anybody? RV. 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 Now tell me, is the RV larger in volume than the LV the same or smaller? In the normal. Take 200 normals off the street. It's larger in volume. Okay, so you're saying the RV volume is larger than the LV in 200 normals off the street. And that's why the, the EF is lower for the RV. Okay. okay, all right, I can't pimp you on that. You're absolutely right. So the RV volume is larger. Now, if I find the aortic valve and put it in my crosshair, if I put it in a four chain review by left clicking and rotating down the septum, left click, rotate down the septum. Okay, now tell me, which is the larger volume, RV or LV? Well, it looks like the RV is larger, but I said larger volume, right? <laughs> I'm confusing you, okay. The, the RV in the four chain review should never look larger than the LV. In the four chain review, that is a truism and that is, a, that is what our echocardiographers teach us. But if you take the same patient and simply left click into a short axis view, now tell me which is the larger volume. Okay, the larger chamber now looks like to be the RV instead of LV. The truth is that volumetrically, the RV is always the larger volume than the LV because its ejection fraction is only 45%. So by the law of conservation of mass, the stroke volumes have to be equivalent between the two chambers. So the RV, it has to be volumetrically larger than the LV because it has to pump the same stroke volumes and cardiac output. And that is the case. However, in the four chamber view, the echo rule of thumb is that it should never look larger than the LV and that is the case. But you take the same one and look at it in this view, and all of a sudden it looks bigger. And everybody who comes from echo to MRI or CT says, man, that RV looks big. And I tell them, yeah, it looks big because you never really saw it in the first place. In echo, we see this much of the RV because this aspect of the RV is cut off on the edge of our sector in echo. And we have collectively agreed to imagine that that's all there is in echo. We just, all of us have agreed to a convention that that's all we're gonna see and there must not be any more. But when you switch from echo to MRI and CT, you will see that there's a lot more of the RV that you ever, that you never saw because it was off the screen 
in echo. All right, so the RV is bigger. Now let's think about stress echo. If I ran this patient on a treadmill and this wall right here went down, right here, what, what are you taught? The, what vessel does that supply? LED. LED. Now, in CT, you don't have to guess because there's the LED. And if you follow its tributaries, you can see its little branches here supplying the LED territory. See this? So in CT, there is no mistaking which vessel is going to what. These little branches are supplying a septum, LED territory. There is no question. It's the only modality that shows you the wall and the coronaries supplying them at the same time. So why nobody showed me this before I started reading stress echoes, I don't know. Um, if you follow the RCA distribution here, here's the RCA. You can see the RCA distribution the same way. Here's the RCA supplying its little tributaries down here to the inferior wall. And that's why if you have a wall motion abnormality here, that's coming from the RCA distribution. So this is one of the best modalities to sort of solidify all that book knowledge that we all just kind of bulk memorized. Now, let's talk about surface anatomy. Here's the right ventricle, here's the left ventricle. This is the interventricular groove separating them. And the LAD goes right down that groove. Diagonal branches along the lateral wall. These are pulmonary artery branches that are kind of in our way and we can cut through them. Here's the appendage. Seahorse shaped is how it's been described. It can be whatever shape it wants. And on Thursday in EP imaging for Watchmen, we're gonna review all the different shapes. If you cut underneath it, you are going to see the left main bifurcation into its ramus and cirque here in everybody. Okay, so if you find the appendage, you cut underneath it, you will find the left main coming off the left side of Alsava. And that's why this is our home position from an LEO cranial view, because we like to clear the left main LAD and circ at the very beginning of our CT scan so we can get it out of the way. As I rotate around the heart, this dark band right here is the great cardiac vein. We like it dark because it's not as important as the artery. When I look posteriorly from this view, this is the spine, cut through the spine. Here's the descending aorta. Here's the pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium and the appendage from a posterior view. On Thursday, I'm gonna show you about 15% of people have an accessory appendage sticking off here. And a couple of times I've seen a clot in the accessory appendage and it makes me very hard to do a cardioversion after a TEE now. I pretty much put all my patients on Eliquis for four weeks without doing a TEE cardioversion. This view is an REO view of the SVC and IVC from a volume rendered picture. I'm gonna switch it to a MIP so you can look. This is SVC, this is right atrial appendage, and this is IVC. SVC, right atrium and right atrial appendage, and IVC. This is the bicable view by TEE. When you're doing a TEE and you switch to 90 degrees, you look at it this way though, you look at it with it turned sideways in the TEE, sorry, in the TEE lab like this. This is a bicable view by TEE, 90 degrees with the SVC coming in to the right atrium, IVC coming in, you usually inject some bubbles and look to see if it crosses between the LA and the right atrium. So this is right atrium, right atrial appendage, SVC, IVC. The bicable view by TEE is nothing more than the in situ view of the SVC, IVC from this view, same view, okay? So you're gonna become a really good TEE guy 
or a gal, the more CT you do. And here is the azagus sneaking up along the spine here, and it's going to insert into the back of the SVC right here. You never really see it by TEE, but you sure see it by, by, uh, by CT. Okay. Now let's look inside the heart for a second. There's two things I want to show you, and then I want you guys to practice. There is two landmarks inside the cardiac chambers that you should remember. One is in the back of the right atrium and one is in the right ventricle. Anybody know what this little dingleberry here is in the back of the right atrium? Crista terminalis. That's right, a crista terminalis. It is a little fibrous invagination of the posterior right atrial wall that is formed by the fibrous portion and muscular portion of the right atrium as it invaginates in the posterior right atrial wall during embryonic life. What arrhythmia comes right down that? Flutter. Flutter. So flutter comes, your, in fact, your inferior deflection in lead two on atrial flutter comes right down that. There's also some um, atrial crista terminalis dependent uh, tax that can come from that area too because that's heterogeneous conduction between fibrous and muscular right atrium. The crista terminalis has been cut out and placed in a pan in the operating room because the CT imagers called it a myxoma or a tumor. I have been called to the operating room probably three times in 15 years and a, and a um, surgeon pissed off will call me and say, look in the pan, what do you think that is? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, that's the normal crystal terminalis that was called a small myxoma or a right atrial tumor or something. So recognize that that is a normal structure in the back of the right atrium. The way you'll determine it is if you cut plane and follow it up, it's right where the SVC comes in. So right where the superior vena cava here, comes into the right atrium, if there's this little ditzel like this, sticking back, don't be very careful before you call that a tumor. Get, get some opinions before you go in there cutting this thing out. This one's kind of small and you'd probably say, Basine, anybody gonna cut that little thing out? But sometimes it can be quite large and have a knuckle on the end and people wanna cut that out and you never wanna be in that position. The crista terminalis is different from the crista supraventricularis, which is in the right ventricle. So here's the right ventricle. And the, this is the crista supraventricularis, a little tuft of meat that separates the pulmonic valve leaflets up here from the tricuspid valve leaflets down here. And have you guys ever heard of a supracrystal VSD? So a supracrystal VSD is a VSD that occurs superior to the crista supraventricularis. That's the different crista from the crista in the back of the right atrium, which is called the crista terminalis, okay? All right, that's it for anatomy. What I want you guys to do is now practice. Um, and the case that I want you to do is, two, is case 200. 